All right. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. How many of you got a present yesterday? At least one. Just one? How many of you got more than one? Okay, very good. How many of you have Christmas celebrations still to come, like today? Yeah, a lot of uh, people. We have one. We'll be traveling up to Macon to be with my wife's family this afternoon or this evening, eating more food and opening more presents. So one of the greatest, greatest things in the world is we get to be here today to do this right here, to talk about Jesus, to look at Jesus, to be reminded of what Christmas is all about. So it's a great thing, and I'm glad you're here. If you're a guest of ours, uh, you can use the QR code. It's not up there right now. It was. You can fill out a, a VIP connection card. Just like know who you are and what's going on with you. And you, if you fill out the card, you can put it in the offering basket as you leave. We'd appreciate that. Not a lot of announcements to make today. No, no uh, ministry events this evening or on Wednesday night. And um, it's just kind of a week to slow down a little bit and uh, be with family and take down Christmas decorate way I know, to do whatever you do. I'm not going to suggest anything. You just get out there and do it. But it's good that you're here. We want to pray for the people around us. Uh, if you'll remember, some of you may remember way back in the beginning of the uh, coronavirus uh, spectacle, uh, one of the things I said on a fairly regular basis on those nights when I was sitting in that little room talking to you all over, the, uh, over Facebook is that, you know, Life happens while life is happening. Life doesn't stop just because it's the Christmas season. Life goes on. And so there are people dealing with issues in their life. Uh, Russell was telling me today, this morning, that his um, daughter's mother-in-law passed away on Christmas Eve. And, uh, you know, just life happens while life is happening. So we, we celebrate the joy of Christmas, the joy of Christ, and we also... We also react to our world with the heart of Christ, and we share <clears throat> in those things that they carry and that are heavy. And that's one of our great privileges as followers of Christ. Good to have you here this morning. Let's pray, and then we're going to move on. Father, we thank you for the privilege to be here on this street corner in this little town uh, to worship you. This is not our service. This is not our time. Father, this is your time. And we bring ourselves to you as an offering, our hearts, our minds, our attitudes, our words, the way we sing, the way we say the Bible. Father, everything we do, we, we bring it as an offering of worship to you. And Father, I ask you for the glory and honor of your son, Jesus Christ, that you would just pour into us here in these moments as we celebrate Christmas on this day after Christmas. Just remind us of all that is true and good and wholesome and pure and holy. We love you. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the history of the church, Christmas wasn't just a day. Christmas is an entire season. In fact, today is the second day of Christmas. So we will get to sing Christmas carols this Sunday and next Sunday as we continue through the 12 days of Christmas. The first one that we're starting with this morning is one that comes out of perhaps a little bit of a dark place. Longfellow had lost his wife in 1861 as, as, as the Civil War was beginning. A couple of years later, his son died as a result of disobeying his father and going into service in the war. And so on Christmas Day in 1863, Longfellow said, I thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men, but he knew there was no peace on earth in the time of war. And in our own hearts today, there may be less than peace. There may be less than goodwill, but we celebrate a Christ who came to bring us hope and joy. So would you stand together as we sing, I heard the bells on Christmas day.
seated. I thought I'd take a moment to read from one of my second favorite texts of Christmas. It is by that renowned author, <laughs> Dr. Seuss. Toward the end of the story, as you may remember, the Grinch has stolen all of the presents, all of the food, all of the decorations, because he wanted to stop Christmas from coming. So he paused, and the Grinch put his hand to his ear, and he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started in low, then it started to grow. But the sound wasn't sad. Why, this sounded merry. It couldn't be so, but it was merry. Very. He stared down at Whoville. The Grinch popped his eyes. Then he shook. What he saw was a shocking surprise. Every Who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons, it came without tags, it came without packages, boxes, or bags. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And so with the Who's and with the Grinch, we continue our own celebration. We sing together, Fahu Fores, Dahu Dores, welcome Christmas. This is a blessed and glorious time for us to sing. So would you join as we sing a medley of O Little Town of Bethlehem and Away in a Manger.
we'll continue our worship together. Would you stand as we sing the first Noel, please? The miracle, the dream of Christmas is not in healing or happiness or even in peace on earth. The true miracle is when we allow the life of this tiny babe to become incarnate in our lives. We make this Christmas thing last. Here now as Katie leads us in worship. Dreamed that he. 
Some people call it a moment of clarity. I think for those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we would call it a moment of revelation or a moment of discernment, a moment when God speaks to us. But there are those moments in our lives where we just know in that moment we got we to gotta do something. We've got to respond in some certain kind of way to what has been given into our heart and given into our mind. I'm not talking about, um, and they're not inconsequential, but I'm not talking about things like where we resolve to finish our Christmas shopping before December next year or where we resolve to eat less from Thanksgiving through Christmas next year, although maybe we probably do need to think about it. I'm talking about the, the bigger kind of life-changing moments where we there is this resolve that's that's not only born in us, but it grows in us. Um, we, we talk about the Advent season, and we have the, uh, the candles of the Advent season, the candle of, of hope and peace and joy and love, and then the Christ candle. And I'm really, I'm really, I'm pushing that we add a, a sixth candle 
to the Advent candle wreath. And we call it the candle of resolve. That we, 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 we do that because if Christmas is really what we say it, it is, what we believe it is, if Jesus is who he says he is, and I believe he is, then really Christmas demands from us some kind of response. Besides just eating a lot of food and exchanging presents and seeing family, and those things are great, great, great. But there is a bigger response that Christmas calls for from us. As a matter of fact, that's the invitation of Christ always to come. Come to me, all you who are labor and you're weary, you're, you're, you're weighed down. Take my yoke upon you. Respond to me. To all who receive me and believe in my name, I give you the right to become sons and daughters of God. Respond. So, I, you know, I look at Christmas and it's one day in the review, which means it's how many days till Christmas? There you go. It's, it's coming downhill fast. It'll be here before you know it. Resolve, if you were to look up that word in, in its verb um, usage, it, it means to decide firmly on a course of action as a noun, a firm determination to do something. I, I, I think the candle of resolve would be how it is that we come to the place where we make a firm determination to do something, to respond in a specific way to this incredible story of Christmas. Resolve. I want to show you in Scripture an example of resolve. Can I do that? And then we'll move on. But it's not a Christmas passage, okay? Although the whole Bible is a Christmas passage in the bigger sense of the word. But in uh, the Gospel of Luke, I mean, I'm sorry, in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, there is this encounter between Jesus and a woman. It's a very familiar story, and we're not going to break down the story in terms of studying the, the entire passage because that's not the, the point that's on my heart to bring to you today. But I'll, there's really one thing I want you to see. We've kind of got to read to get to it. John chapter 8, verse 1. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and he taught them. And, you know, I look forward to heaven one day. You know, when, when Jesus is going to come sit down in the middle of us and teach. He's just going to talk. And we get to talk to him about all the things that we want to know. And he's going to have every answer. Every answer. And he'll be able to explain it perfectly. And we'll be going, oh, well, okay. Well, verse 3, the scribes, the Pharisees, they brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. We know this story placing her in the midst. And the, the sense of the, the Greek texting here is that she literally had been caught in the bed, maybe even just wrapped up in the sheets and brought out there in her, in her shame, thrown down there in the middle of all these people. And they said to him, to Jesus, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? This they said to test him, to trap him, so to speak, that they might have some charge to bring against him. And so Jesus bent down, and he wrote with his finger on the ground. We can learn a lot about Jesus right there, about how to handle adversarial moments. And sometimes the best thing is to not say anything at all, at least immediately. Verse 7, and as they continued to ask him, they kept you know, well, what do you say? What about, you know, you know, egging him on. He stood up and he said, well, okay, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. What a wise answer. And once more he bent down and he wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And Jesus stood up and he said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. And then it's this very last part I want to focus on. This is resolve right here. This is a moment of clarity. This is a moment where this woman can either allow this growing resolve, this firm determination to do something, take root or not. Jesus said, you need to go, and from now on, sin no more. Go and go differently. Get back on the journey, but... but but let's, let's use not a path. Go, but don't keep going the way you're going. This is a moment of clarity. 
This is a moment where there's some resolve needs to bubble up, where this woman says, you know what? Wow. If Jesus hadn't been here, this would have been my last day. And we don't know a lot about it. We don't know, we don't know what kind of resolve she, she grew inside of her as a result of this moment of coming into contact with Jesus. But there is there's always, when we come into contact with the holiness of God, with the presence of God, with the truth of who Jesus is, I mean, there's always, there's always this opportunity to respond to, if I can use a, a, a more modern-day approach, to grow a spine and say, you know what, yeah, God's who he is, and he's right, and his way is always right. I mean, if you look through Scripture, we don't have time to go front to back, but I mean, you just probably think of some of them off the top of your head of men and women who in, in, have been come in contact with the glory of God and the purpose of God and the instruction of God and, and the love of God and, and the grace of God and the mercy of God. They just absolutely responded with deep resolve and they just followed him completely, whether it's Noah building an ark in the face of all the ridicule that was around him because God said so, or whether it's Abraham following after this promise to be the father of many nations, though he was childless at the time, or Moses, who's, who's talking to a burning bush, but it changed his life. Even though he, he, he argued with God a little bit, that resolve was growing, and we see him responding to God's call in his life. Mary, when an angel says, Mary, you're going to have a baby. He's like, what? Yeah. And she responded to that. She sings out that beautiful song of praise as she comes to understand what God is doing in her, or whether it's Peter, after his incredible betrayal, and he comes in, into contact with the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus after the resurrection, and then he, we see him, the great preacher of Pentecost, people with great resolve, and that resolve was birthed in a contact and looking at who Jesus is, Paul on the Damascus Road, the woman at the well, who in spite of all the things and all of her relationships and all of her husband's and the one she was living with that wasn't a husband, she became a missionary after meeting Jesus. And she went back and spread the word. Christmas calls for us to grow a spine, so to speak. For us to not excuse ourselves and just kind of enjoy all the trimmings of Christmas, whether it's gifts and family and friends and decorations and food, but, but to really sit back say, wow, what's my response to Jesus coming? What's my response to God with us, Emmanuel? So I want to challenge you, if I could, in really looking at the characters in the Christmas story that are so familiar to us. And I want to just draw something from each, each one of those groups, if I might. It might be that this year, at this Christmas season, you need to resolve, and I need to resolve, we need to resolve to come to Jesus. And we see that in the shepherds. They received an invitation to come from the angelic host. You remember that? And what did they do? They went. See, this is the greatest part about the story of Christmas is that this is the beginning of the revelation of the salvation of all, of all mankind. Through Christ, his atoning blood, for all who receive him and believe in his name, there is salvation. The forgiveness of sin now, for all of eternity, purpose in life, the Holy Spirit living in us. God has called us to himself at Christmas. He invites us to come. Romans 10, 13 says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And there are probably some people sitting in this room or watching online that though you know the story of Jesus and you know what Christmas is about, and you know the story of Easter, and you've been in Sunday school, and you've been in vacation Bible school, and maybe you had a grandmother that talked about the Bible a lot while you were around, or a granddaddy who read, or parents. You have never come to the place, to the place of surrendering to Jesus Christ, of answering his invitation, of coming to him and bowing down. My friend, listen to me. I love you so much. And I, I'm thankful for every present you got and every bit of food you ate and whatever you got going on. But I want to tell you something. If you die and leave this world without knowing Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, that's bad. Christmas is about a Savior. Christmas is about one who came to live among us, and he invites us to come to him, to come and to bow down, to surrender, to confess our sins. I know of some right now that I'm in conversation with different people, different places, 
And we're in this part of the conversation about Jesus right now. Preacher, I just, I just don't think I'm quite ready yet. I'm like, well, what do you mean you're not ready? You, you were born in sin. You were ready from the day you were born. You needed Jesus. No, no, I just got to get my life straightened up, cleaned up. And I'm like, okay, you're never going to come to Jesus if you wait till you get your life straightened up. Because you can't get your life straight apart from Christ. It's just be a constant thing. I don't know how many of you in this room had multiple children growing up in your home or grandchildren. We had three boys about 16 months apart, give or take. And I'll tell you what, you could not, you could not get one area of our house clean and move to the next room, but what, the room you just left would become a battlefield. I mean, it was just obvious that something had died in there. A bomb had gone off. And so you finish this room, you go back over here. And those little buggers would go to another room. Pulling out stuff. Like, you know, children do that kind of stuff. And that's kind of how it is. If you're one of those people that's like, I could get my life straight, and then I'm going to come to Jesus and surrender to him. I want to tell you, you'll never get it straight. Those rooms will never, you can't do it. It's all about surrender. It's about bringing your life the good, the bad, and the ugly, bringing it in there and saying, God, this is all I got, and it ain't nothing. But you say you love me, and I believe that because I believe you are who you are. I give you my life. Would you come? Would you come? Forgive me of my sins. Live in me. Father, make my life an offering to you. Man, Jesus will move in. He loves you that much. That's, that takes some resolve. It's hard to admit you're a sinner. It's hard to bow before the king and say, I have sinned against you. I confess that. I agree with you, Jesus. I need a Savior. I give you my heart. Maybe, maybe some of us in here need to look at the wise men in the Christmas story, and we need to develop a little bit of a resolve to, to let go of, to surrender the baubles, the, 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 the fake jewelry of this world, and instead search after the riches of knowing Jesus Christ. I'll, I'll tell you. Looking around, we're more and more, especially here in America, because this, this country is, is so blessed in so many ways, but man, I just see that a lot of times Christian families and couples, and I see it in young ones coming up sometimes, that they're, just, they're losing sight of the glory of Christ in their life in their pursuit of the things that this world says you got to have, and they're important, and they give you status or or, or, or that promise to bring happiness. We, we, we need to come to the place where we realize that we're just pilgrims passing through. There's nothing permanent in this world. There's not anything wrong with fun stuff or good stuff or having this or having that. But man, when that becomes the pursuit of our life, the goal of our life, we've missed it. In Matthew 16, 26, the Bible says, what, what's the profit of man if he gains the whole world, but he forfeits his soul? What? what, what? What will a man give in return for his soul? In Matthew 6, 19, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break and steal. We see the Magi, when they came and they found Jesus in the house, his glory and his majesty and their understanding of who he was, it, it brought Upon them, this, this resolve that, you know, all these treasures we carry, they really, they really are of no value to us in the face of Christ. And what did they do? They gave. They gave. They let go of that. Because there was, there was nothing compared to bowing before the king of all kings. Jim Elliott uh, made one of the great statements about pursuing Christ and the riches of his grace that's ever been made out of human lips, when he said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Maybe our resolve needs to match out of the, the wise men where we realize maybe we're holding on to the treasures of this world a little too tightly and we're missing the riches of the grace, the supernatural working of the power of Christ in us. Maybe we need to resolve to trust God when the path takes a very sudden and unexpected turn 
or ventures in a new, new direction. We kind of learned that from Mary and Joseph, if you look. They were betrothed, and then the next thing you know, she's pregnant. And then Joseph is thinking about putting her away quietly, and then God intervenes and says, nope, I want you to take her to yourself as your wife. Wow. And then that whole journey. You're talking about a, you're talking about a 90 degree turn. You know, life does that to us. Life does. I, it's all I can do not to giggle when I'm talking with college students sometimes. And I love to ask the question, what do you, what do you want to be when you grow up? They got it laid out. And, and they just, you know, and I just sit there and I'm like, that's so cute. And I hope, I hope that's what works out. If you're going to follow Christ, you need to understand that he may have you on this direction right now, but somewhere down the road, a year from now, two years, 10, 20, you might find all of a sudden that God's turned the right turn signal on. And he's saying, okay, now we're going a new way, a different way, a new direction. Trust him when that happens. We're told in Proverbs, Right? And then that part that's so important, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll direct your paths. It's that leaning on our own understanding that usually gets us in trouble. I want, I, I want, I want to challenge you to, to, to let the resolve grow in you that as you walk with Christ, when he points in a direction that you did not expect, trust him with that. Trust him and go with him. You know, we have one on our prayer list every week, one that's very close to us. Everybody knows who Buffy is. Everybody know Buffy? Buffy Buff. I'll never forget the day she came and sat in my office and she said, Preacher, I really feel like the Lord's leading me to move to Africa. I'm like, say what? Yep, Uganda. I said, okay. She said, so tell me what I need to do to get ready to go. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, pray? And we sat together and we put together a plan. Uh, she, she actually had the plan mostly. She was just kind of sharing it and seeing if I could see any holes in it. And she had the plan to, she's going to do this. She's just going to divest herself of all of her stuff here, you know. And eventually that meant her, her the shelves are over her head. And, and you know, with her, how was she going to live until she departed? And God provided for that. And and she went, and she'd been over there now for several years. And she comes home, we get to share with her. She hasn't been home in a while, but hopefully soon she will be. And, and you know, there are a lot of people, if at, Kevin, are you in here? How old was she when she went over there? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot or anything. <laughs> How many years younger? She was in her mid-50s, mid I'd say. You know, there's a lot of people in their mid-50s, they're, 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 they're assuming that they're set on their life's trajectory, that their path is good. And there's a lot of people in their mid-50s, if God said, okay, right turn, right here, right turn, we're going in a different direction. And a lot of us would say, no, I don't think so. I mean, God just eight more years, and I'll have full retirement here, and I'll be able to draw this much money, and I'll... You know, and sometimes God says, trust me, I, I'm, I'm your best retirement plan you've got. But that takes resolve. It takes the spine to trust God when the path all of a sudden goes in a different direction than you were expecting. And then finally, I would just encourage you to, to have a firm determination and resolve here in the days after Christmas and as we head into a new year to, to intentionally seek his presence every day. Not, not just with a quiet time. You need to have a quiet time every day. Spending time in the word of God, just having conversations with God. But outside of the closet, outside of your prayer room, to to. To set your heart on the Holy Spirit frequency, if I can put it that way. To just have a sensitivity to his activity and his presence and his speaking. To know his voice. To recognize the way he nudges us with this Holy Spirit all throughout the course of a day. To resolve 
to be very sensitive and thoughtful and intentional. God, I want to be everywhere you are. And I only want to be where you want me to be. God, I just want to go with you. In, in my own life, you know, I go through these seasons where I really feel like I need to sharpen those senses. I mean, and you might sit there and say, that's, ah, that's kind of ridiculous, Keith. Well, you know, when you're simple-minded like me, sometimes you just got to do stuff like this. But I mean, I mean, there are times when I'm just, I'm, you know, I feel like I've, I've kind of gotten hard of hearing and, and, and I really need to be reminded of the promise of his presence in, in my life. And, and so I'll go through days where every t- every, everything I get ready to do, I'm like, God, where do you want me to go eat lunch today? Where do I need to go eat lunch today so that I'm crossing paths with the person that you got out there for me to talk to? God, I only want to eat where, wherever. And you know what? There have been times where I just get, it pops into my head, go to Subway. And I go to Subway and I run into somebody and we end up having a 30-minute talk right there about Jesus and about hope and about forgiveness or whatever it might be. There's other times when I, I think it's kind of, kind of, God's kind of saying, wherever you want to, <laughs> your choice. You go anywhere. I'll be there with you. Driving where, where I'm, I, I start, you know, I look around and say, you know, who can I pray for? I can pray for that person that's driving in front of me. And not because they kept me off and I'm mad at them. Just pray for them for God's blessing on their, on their life. You know, learning to get just as we get tuned back in to how God works around us and in us and, and to, to, to say that prayer before I go to see somebody at their home or take that phone call where, God, I have no idea what this phone call is about, but I just pray for wisdom to how to respond. And, Father, if I just need to be silent and not say anything, give me the wisdom to be silent. Practice, practice the presence of Christ. Seek the presence. Recognize his voice. Recognize the way he nudges us. The psalmist Tells us in Psalm 139, verse 3, look, you've searched out my path, my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. Verse 7 of the same psalm. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Nowhere. All through there. There's nowhere I can go you're not. So, man, that means he's with me all the time because of the Holy Spirit of Christ living in me. And that's one of the great promises, by the way, of the Great Commission. We're told to go and make disciples of all the nations, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teach them all things that Jesus has taught us. And then in verse 20, what does Jesus say? And remember this, I am with you to the end of the age. I'm right there with you. My wife, bless her heart, much of course she has to be my wife, There are times when my wife, in her graceful way, will say to me, I mean, we'll be sitting on the couch together. And she'll say, where are you? And of course, there is that male side of me that says, baby, I'm sitting right here next to you. I usually can't stop myself before I say something smart like that. And she goes, I know you're right next to me, but you're not with me. Where are you? She's asking me what, what's, what has taken me away from her presence, even though I'm right there next to her. And I wonder how many times in the course of a day Holy Spirit would need to whisper in our ears, Keith, where are you? Do you remember I'm right here with you? I'm right here. What's gotten you so distracted that you've missed my presence? I would guess that over the course of the last four weeks, you've heard among the many names of Christ, this God child laid in a manger of straw. You've heard many of his names, Prince of Peace, Wonderful Counselor. But maybe the one you've heard more than any of the others outside of the name Jesus is that name Emmanuel. And and that name means so much to us at Christmas because Emmanuel means God with us. 
died on the couch of our life with us. And he loves you so much. Resolve. Resolve to seek out his holiness and his presence in your life. So as we close our service today, uh, I'm going to ask you to remain seated. We're going to turn the lights down in the house. And I want to leave you with a, a thought. It'll be up here on the screen. Um, and when this is done, we will be dismissed. And we will go and continue the Christmas celebration. Uh, the 12 days of Christmas. March on. Listen, listen, listen to this great encouragement as we get ready to leave this place. Jeff, go ahead. above us, God sees. From far beyond us, God hears. From his eternal distant home, God loves. He sees all people in all places. And it's easy for us to imagine that he does so from this perspective. High beyond, distant. But then, Christmas. It appears without earthly fanfare or celebration. The cry of this child screams that the same God who is above and beyond and distant has not only come close to us, but that he's indeed with us. So what if the name Emmanuel means what it means. Today, now, with us, the manger proclaims that the very presence of God is now present with us. In the mundane, in the uncertainty, in the mystery that lies beyond our understanding or explanation, God himself is with us in our joy and our happiness. He's with us in our sadness and our brokenness. He celebrates in the light with us, and he holds us in the dark with faithful and secure arms. What if the name Emmanuel means what it means? Christmas not only begs that we ask that question, but also provides the answer that our hearts have been longing for all along. Can this possibly be? Yes, it can. And it is God with us, Emmanuel. And he's closer than our wildest dreams can ever imagine. Oh, God.